three and. So today I'm going to talk about something that's been uh, requested by a couple people, uh, the goos and glues that I use, I did a rhyme, um, <laughs> uh, on the restoration of Rosalind. Um, now this is, uh, this is a pretty large subject um, which uh, has a lot of nuances to it that not everyone, not even all professionals know about and I, I would not claim to know everything about by any means I do not but I try to learn about the the chemistry and the compatibility and the conditions that different adhesives like um, and that will get the best out of them so um, to oversimplify um, there are three major families of glues that that I use um, that I use here I'm going to immediately show you a glue that is not part of any of those families because that's what I'm like. Um, so uh, one of the oddballs is tight bond, um, which should be is familiar to pretty much everyone. And this is not something I use a lot. It doesn't have a lot of applications in boat building. Um, mostly it's used for putting in bungs over fasteners because it's a glue that will respond well to a very tight fit, which usually a bung is, and it does not prevent you from removing the fastener later down the line if that becomes a thing. Um, you can chip the bung out, the glue hasn't completely filled the slot in the screw or around the bolt or whatever, um, so it's good for that sort of thing. Um, I have a feeling that there are more things that you could use this for, uh, but I do not have the data on that and I have not tried it. Um, so there's that. Um, there's a couple of other glues that friends of mine use that are not in the three major families that I'm about to talk about. Um, chiefly resorcinol, which is you know an old, an old type of resin. Uh, there are urea formaldehyde glues. There's, um, I mean, there's all kinds of other other resins and other glues, but a lot of them have difficulties in a marine environment. So for the most part, we have three major families that we use. We have oil-based things, we have epoxy-based things, and we have polyurethane-based things. So um, firstly, we have oil-based things. Uh, so liquid oil-based things, uh, we have linseed oil. It was one of the oldest things there is for putting on stuff that goes in the water. Uh, this is actually very nice purified raw linseed oil um, from an old friend of mine uh, at uh, Earthen Flax, her business is called. Um, 
very, very nice stuff. It's been filtered. There's not all kinds of extraneous organic matter in it, which is, is good. Um, so this I use on things that I don't want to dry out too quickly. It's not generally a permanent coating, but it, it's a good temporary coating that slows drying and you know the moisture exchange in and out of wood um, when you don't want that to happen. And then if you're then going to go over it with a planer, it doesn't fill it full of goo, um, which is very nice. Um, we also have obviously paint. We have all kinds of paint, but at this stage of the project, I'm mostly priming things. I'm not putting top coats on hardly anything yet. And the primer that I primarily use is uh, the primer is from Pisano Paints, uh, this Penrust line. Now they do two different ones that I use, uh, the rust preventative coating and the lacquer resisting rust preventative coating. The lacquer resisting one is I think better. Um, it seems to adhere better for longer. Um, I'm not quite sure what the chemistry difference is between them, to be honest. Uh, I should do more research on that. But on the whole, if I can get this, I will use this. Um, this hangs on for dear life. Like I, so many times uh, in my career, I have stripped paint off of something that's peeling and this is underneath and it's completely fine. Like, you know, you're scraping and none of it even comes off. Like the paint on top is just gone, but this hangs on, which is nice. Um, yeah, so I prime a lot with this. Um, briefly, I want to discuss uh, a subject which is kind of a hot topic at the moment, um, which is red lead. Um, so this is not red lead. And until recently, I used quite a bit of red lead for a number of things. I, you can probably, you can see some down here actually. Um, and I primed the top of the deck beams before the deck went down. Um, Largely because that has, that was what had been done before uh, when I demoed the the deck that the boat came with, it all had red lead on top, and so many professionals use the stuff still, and what I've discovered is that like there's not actually a lot of knowledge that most people have about the stuff. Um, turns out there isn't really any reason to use it anymore. It's very toxic to people and it is not very toxic to the things we want it to be toxic to. Um, lead, lead's toxicity relies on it being able to form lead oxide. And when it is in a paint, it does not reliably do that. As soon as you're sanding and stripping it off and it's getting all over you, it forms the lead oxide and gets into your lungs and messes up your body. But um, in this context, I've actually been told by what I consider a reliable source that milk is more fungicidal than this. Um, so I do not use red lead anymore, and I'm slightly ashamed of myself that I've used so much of it before, but uh, we live and we learn. Um, so I hope, I hope that somebody sees this video that was about to use some red lead and that they then don't. Um, as far as I can tell, really the reason that it was used and it was so prevalent is that until relatively recent technology came around, it was one of the very few paints we had access to that dried very quickly and dried hard and would adhere to metal. It's very good for coating metal, you know, if you're doing wire rigging and also, you know, it has its applications. I'm not knocking it, but um, in this application, this fully replaces it. This is, this is, uh, I believe, an iron oxide base, which you would think would cause um, galvanic issues, but as far as I've heard, it does not. Um, you know, the, 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 the metal salt that's in the paint stays in the paint and it's encapsulated. So this, this is really a big step up. This is equally or more toxic to the things we want it to be and vastly less toxic to people and it dries just as quickly. It leaves a beautiful surface that grabs the paint that you put over it really, really well. So this is what I use now. Um, I also use some Stockholm tar. Again, very, very old technology. This is a byproduct of um, stripping, you know, uh, turpentine and whatnot out of pine trees originally. Um, uh, that generally gets mixed with linseed oil into what we call a boat soup. 
which goes on all kinds of stuff. I use on some of the small boats that I've, you know, that I work on. Um, I'm going to use it probably quite a bit in the upper works and the rigging on this boat um, and other boats, boats that I work on. Um, I'm not going to have a lot of what most people would consider a bright finish on this boat. Most of it's going to be, you know, linseed oil and pine tar or one or the other. Um, because that's how I roll. I'm not a varnish guy. <laughs> um, that being said, uh, I do intend to use some, uh, I don't actually have it out here because I don't remember where I put it, but uh, some Le Tonquinois, uh, which is an old school linseed oil based varnish, which uh, you know is as unvarnishy as varnish gets, basically. It's much more forgiving and sensible in my, <laughs> my opinion. Um, so I also use a bunch of oil-based sort of solids um, as bedding compounds, uh, primarily dolphinite. Um, this honestly, chemically is very similar to uh, unpigmented old paint. You know, it's, it's just oil-based putty, essentially. Um, so I use this uh, for bedding where planks goes on, uh, bedding in between, you know, structural timbers. Uh, now uh, that, you know, I'm in a position to actually buy this stuff in, you know, in part due to the support of all of you. So thank you. Um, prior to that, I used an awful lot of roofing tar, which is kind of the, the poor man's equivalent as a lot to be said for it. You get an enormous amount of the stuff for a small amount of money. You can cover much larger areas of things that like, you look at these quart tins of this stuff and you look at how much it costs and you just, it brings on the existential dread, um, thinking of, <laughs> you know, bedding some of these massive things with dolphinite. Um, whereas with roofing tar, especially roofing tar that comes in a caulking tube that you can dispense with a caulking gun is um, a lot easier on your body and your soul um, but that being said, roofing tar has a number of problems. Some of the volatiles that are in it will actually delignify wood over long periods of time. However, the periods of time we're talking about are very long and it's not really a problem. Um, people get a little fussy about that kind of thing. And honestly, it's not a big deal. Um, bigger deal, especially in the context of a boat that is painted is that uh, the sort of the, 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 the tarry, black tarry oil uh, that is in the tar will leach through top coat. Um, so, you know, you're painting something white and there's like, there's an intersection between two timbers that has tar behind it. You'll end up with this kind of brown discoloration down the side, which not everyone cares about. I sometimes care about it, I sometimes don't, but there's a lot of people that do care about that kind of thing, in which case this is definitely the way to go. This does not leach in any way. Um, another issue actually with both of these and in general with oil-based things is that uh, you really have to prime or seal in some way timber before putting this stuff on. A lot of people have not done that. The, worked on boats that I've taken apart. And what happens is if you don't somehow seal the wood, the wood is porous and it will actually suck the oils out of this. Uh, and once you've sucked the oils out of this, really what you've got left with is this horrible chalky mess, which is not a bedding compound. It's actually doing the opposite. It's actually, you know, it's become a full on solid and it's actually holding the two pieces you're trying to bed apart from each other and making space for water and, fungus and critters and whatnot to move in. So um, sealing with linseed oil, priming with this stuff, uh, that's key to using any of these oil-based compounds. Um, I also actually use a bit of this sometimes um, because this mixed with bottom paint is, as far as I can tell, almost identical to the very expensive brown underwater seam compound that you buy at marine chandleries and whatnot. It has all the same ingredients. This is just a linseed oil based glazing putty. You mix bottom paint into it for the fungicidal properties, or I mean, you could 
you can mix in some of this, which, you know, I use this occasionally for things that are going to be buried really deeply. This is a uh, copper naphthenate wood preservative. It's pretty nasty stuff. Um, I don't use a lot because it's pretty nasty, but you could do that. Um, yeah, so if you're on a budget, there are ways to get around it. Um, you can also, with roofing tar and Portland cement, make you know, a pretty decent old school fisherman style um, seam compound. So that's oil-based things. Now, oil-based things do not want to be applied to a wet surface. They don't like it, they don't stick. Um, and that's one of the things that like, I feel is not always completely understood is the conditions that all these different things like. So moving on to epoxies, epoxies similarly do not want things to be wet. Uh, they also though do not want things to be oily. So these two don't always play together. There are ways of working around it. Like if you've painted something with an oil-based paint and it's completely cured, you can epoxy something to it, but for the most part, the epoxy will be stuck to the paint and not the substrate. So that can create some problems. Um, in the realm of epoxies, there are all kinds of different, different formulations from different companies for different purposes. Um, you know, the ubiquitous stuff is the West System 105 with the different hardeners that you can put in. You know, this is the fast hardener for using in the winter. I'm not using this at the moment, obviously, because it's summertime, um, but they have the slow one for the summer. They have a whole giant kit of additives that you can add to this that give it all kinds of different non-sag properties or, you know, filleting properties or whatever. Um, and this you can get pretty much anywhere, which is mostly what it's got going for it. Um, you also have West System puts out uh, something they call G-Flex, which is the thing that I use probably more than anything in, uh, in the realm of epoxies. It is a thickened, uh, flexible epoxy, which um, they have also, they've done something with the chemistry of it such that it is not as resistant to sticking to oak as epoxies traditionally are. Epoxies are generally very resistant to sticking to oak because of the tannins and the acidity uh, in oak, which epoxy doesn't like tannins and acidity either. It's actually kind of fussy in a number of ways. Not fussy in some ways, but um, yeah. West has you know, your straight up G-Flex. They also have a pre-thickened G-Flex. You can also put any of the normal additives into G-Flex to give it whatever properties you like. Um, I use G-Flex primarily for the planking scarves, like this one. Um, it's very, very strong. It is much stronger than the wood-to-wood -wood bond between the lignans in the large. So I have no reservations about that. Um, you also have all these tube goos nowadays. Um, this is T88. This, I haven't used a lot of this, but my impression is, uh, you know, this is from System 3, uh, which is a slightly less common company to find products from, but very, very good company. Um, my impression is that this is probably the best one, um, but it's kind of hard to say. I've used them for different things. So um, West has uh, 610, Total Boat has Thixo. Um, I mean, every, every company that makes epoxy has some kind of mixing thickened goo like this that you put in a caulking gun. So that has its applications as well. Um, well, any time that you need to apply something in a way that like it would be very difficult to trowel it on or to brush it on, um, that it's like really advantageous to be able to just squirt it in there. Um, this is this is nice for that. Um, you also have a uh, five minute epoxy from West System. This is you know not something that you use commonly. It's not nearly as strong as the other ones. But if you have something that is not strictly speaking structural that you really need stuck like in the next half an hour or so, it's not really five minute. They, they exaggerate a bit, but um, this will cure pretty well in about half an hour, which a lot of glues don't. So this this helps sometimes. Fairly recently, there was a Dutchman that um, the initial glue up 
like it, it sort of slid out because I hadn't clamped it properly. And in order to get it back on, while the first glue was still able to cure, I just stuck a bit of this in there and that held it on. So, you know, and I'm trying to think of other applications for that. You know, I don't, it's not something I use very much, um, but when you need it, you, you need it. Um, you also have uh, penetrating epoxy, which um, unfortunately Smith's is the best one. I say unfortunately because this is by far the most foul and disgusting epoxy that money can buy. It is absolutely horrible smelling, um, but it is very, very good at what it does. Um, if, you have, if you have something that's rotten that you're not in a position to fully excavate, if you pour a bunch of this in there, it will, uh, it will actually suffocate whatever spores are in there. It won't be able to breathe. Uh, it will be fully encapsulated in this stuff. The stuff will work its way into any open pores, any open crevices. Um, it's, you know, it's very, very thin and it will find its way in. So this also has its applications. Thank God, not every day though. Oh God. Um, thirdly, we have polyurethanes. Um, so polyurethane likes water, unlike these two. Um, this will actually cure quicker underwater than it will out of the water, but does not like oil. So um, if something, you know, if something is primed with this, this will not stick very well. Um, it will stick, but it will not stick very well. Um, and you run into issues with that. This, this stuff really wants bare wood to bare wood contact. Um, it likes to find its way into the pores. It wants the pores to be unsealed. It wants there to be some moisture content in it, which, you know, even dry wood has some, and that helps the curing process. So um, the one that I use the most is uh, this Lumberjack 30 Minute, which comes from the UK. Uh, unfortunately, you can't get it here. I have to have it shipped over here. Um, but this sets, uh, really does actually set in 30 minutes, which is quite remarkable. Um, to look at it when it's applied, it looks exactly the same as Gorilla Glue that we get in a hardware store in the US. But this is, I did some break, you know, break strength testing on this. This is at least five times as strong. And, you know, I know people in the UK use this for structural joints, which like no one over here would ever think of using Gorilla Glue for a structural joint. Um, but people successfully use this for structural joints in the UK. So. It's worth, it's worth buying it and having it shipped here, unfortunately. Um, they also do a five minute formulation that actually does set in five minutes. And their five minute formulation is about the same breaking strength as Gorilla Glue that takes like three hours to set. So why the hell would you use it? Um, I use quite a bit of this, mostly for Bungs, Dutchman, um, uh, you, know, light, you know, light structural repairs, um, splines in seams. Um, it is a bit messy, you know, because it's a foaming glue, but if you're careful to not apply too much and you get to clean up, you know, while it's still curing, uh, it's really not that bad. Um, so I use a bit of that. You also have a bunch of different tube glues that are polyurethane. Um, uh, Cicaflex and 5200 are probably the most well known. You also have 4200, which 4200 and Cicaflex are pretty similar in their breaking strength and adhering properties. Um, this is not as permanent as people make it out to be. It's very difficult to get off, but it's not impossible to get off. Um, that being said, it is horrible trying to get this off. So use this sparingly. This is probably one of the most widely misapplied adhesives in boat building. Um, there's a lot of places where this does not belong, but there are places it does belong. So, um, you know, I will use this. Um, I've used this for some Dutchmen that, you know, needed, um, they needed kind of the body of this like thick, thick adhesive because uh, it was going into like wet, nasty wood, you know, that was, I wasn't ab able to fully excavate behind it. Um, I've used this, God, what else have I used this for? I've heard of people using this for laminating, but I would not personally do that. Um, um, oh, here's some. 
So I ran into some difficulties with my temporary fasteners when I was reframing. Um, I would, uh, every time I put in a new frame, I would put a Galvi lag through the original planking just to hold everything in place. And, you know, I'd, I pre-drilled, but I did not pre-drill like aggressively enough. So when I came to pull all these temporary fasteners out, an awful lot of them snapped and I had to get a hole saw and hole saw them out, which was a bit of a nightmare. And then I had to put these pegs in, you know, to peg those holes. And I feel, I feel very, very good about those pegs being in with 5200. Like that is now a part of the frame. So I don't have to worry about it. And that's the kind of con, like if you want something to be essentially part of something else, that is, is, is a good place to use it. But if it's like, God, I mean, I've, I've heard of people using 5200 to glue faucets together, which is just madness. Never do that. Please, please don't do that. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, oh, also, all of these are cross compatible. I discovered that should you ever have a need, like, so I was on a very, very tight budget in my old job. I only had one tube of this and I had like a dozen Dutchmen to do with it and it was not enough. I discovered that you can mix this with the foaming one and then <laughs> you get about five times as much. Um, it's not as good, obviously, because it has air pockets in it, but it can be done. Should it be done? I don't know, but it can. Um, yeah, so, um, and then I mentioned this before, this is just a, you know, poisonous wood preservative that you know, used sparingly. Um, I've poured it down some bolt holes. I've poured it down, you know, in the dead wood areas. Um, you can actually mix this with things like dolphinite. If it's, you know, if you're bedding a joint that is going to be really, really buried that you, you want to be sure that nothing is going to take up residence down there um, because you're not in a position to take it apart again, probably not a bad idea. You can mix it into that and then it's, it's more poisonous which in boat building is usually good. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sure there are more goos and glues that uh, I have used at times, um, but I cannot immediately think of them. And obviously I could not find them to put them on the bench. So I think that's most of it. And it's just like, it's understanding like, the environmental conditions that each of these adhesives likes and which other adhesives they are prepared to work with and in what way is i think sort of the key to success in, in all this um yeah so those are my thoughts on goos and glues i hope that was of interest and um helpful to somebody anyway um <laughs>